Hi everybody, old guy here. And before I get into this list, salute and rest in peace to Greg Bear, who passed away uh, last week or about 10 days ago. May you soar this universe, fellow traveler. Now, Greg Bear was, of course, one of science fiction's masters, and science fiction royalty at that. Uh, his wife is Paul Anderson's daughter. I had the pleasure of meeting him at the 2018 Escape Velocity Convention, details of which you can glean from a blog post I've linked in the description. Even got him to sign a few books, like my torn up copy of The Forge of God, right there. And I have its sequel, of course, Anvil of Stars, with signature. And even got him to sign this prequel to Eon, which is called Legacy. There he is. Which I have not read yet, which I guess I should. Um, even got a signature on a, one of his short stories from uh, the Mirror Shades anthology. None of his books appear on this list. Um, which is why I always have to put in that so far caveat because you just don't know when you're going to run into next that displaces everything else that you've read before. There's a very good chance that Eon or Blood Music will blow me away and they'll get added. As for now, these are books that I consider purely science fiction. Uh, in other words, they don't have supernatural elements and are not post-apocalyptic, which I consider to be a subgenre of uh, science fiction. It's deserving of its own list, in fact, which preview of coming attractions. Dystopian societies count, but not post-apocalyptic. Now, these books can be scary, or wondrous and even have elements of fantasy in them, but their basis is some kind of science-driven plot. And yes, I know many of these books that I've listed here are not the sterling representatives of the category, but they are books that have, for one reason or another, stayed with me. And I'm not including science fiction novels that I've listed somewhere else as favorites like Mary Doria Russell's uh, The Sparrow and its sequel, Children of God, Anne Leckie's Ancillary Justice and its sequels, uh, Alistair, Alistair Reynolds' uh, Revelation Space and uh, its sequels. That means, of course, that there's more than 10 top science fiction books. Yeah, sue me. So let's get started. Number 10. The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein. This is my favorite novel from an author who is often hit or miss. Starship Troopers, Have Spacesuit Will Travel, Orphans of the Sky, they're home runs. The rest, eh, they go from me to not bad. What's this one about? Well, the first penal colony on the moon has developed a unique culture subject to low gravity and more men than women and is now chafing under the rule of the Earth's lunar authority. Revolutionaries and anarchists and Mike, the supercomputer that loves jokes and is slowly becoming self-aware. Published in 1966, I think this beats Hal by about two years. Number 9, To Your Scattered Bodies Go by Philip Jose Farmer.
I read this in San Francisco during my year of anarchy, 1973. I was blown away by River World and grabbed its sequel, The Fabulous Riverboat, about five seconds after it came off the press. And then waited. And waited. And waited for the concluding book of the trilogy, The Dark Design which felt like Farmer wrote in a couple of hours one night just to get the story finished and off his desk. <laughs> Shades of George R. R. Martin. Number 8. Marooned on Mars by Lester Del Rey. Yes, this is juvenile fiction. I read it when I was a juvenile, so there's no loss of points here. I enjoyed it back then and still remember it fondly. 17-year-old Chuck Svensson stows away on the first expedition to Mars, which he was supposed to be on anyway, but a mess up on dates had the rocket taking off before he reached majority. Bureaucrats, what can you say? So he does what any red-blooded American boy of the 1950s would do defies authority, and almost gets everybody killed. And then there's the rat people. Good times. Number seven, The White Mountains by John Christopher. More juvenile fiction. This involves the alien takeover of the earth and the enslavement of the human population by squids who embed a cap onto every human's head when they turn 14, rendering them docile. Will Parker and his pals run away before they are capped and flee to the mountains where things are not good. This is a fairly terrifying story, the first novel of the Tripods trilogy. Number 6, The Lathe of Heaven by Ursula K. Le Guin. The Left Hand of Darkness gets all the attention, but I think this is her best novel. George Orr can dream effective reality, reality, changing the world every time he sleeps, so he abuses drugs to keep the dreams away. Because he's the only one who remembers reality after uh, one of his dreams alters it. George's therapist attempts to use the dreams to change the world for the better, with disastrous results. Number 5, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. The temperature in which paper ignites and firemen in this future dystopia use flamethrowers to destroy forbidden books, which is just about all of them. Thought control and word burning and punishment for unorthodoxy. Hmm. Sounds a bit familiar. Number four, The Stars, My Destination by Alfred Bester. A roller coaster ride across the solar system with Gully Foil, a sad sack lowlife who ends up becoming the most valuable man in the universe because he can jaunt at will. Jaunt? Oh yes, jaunt. Number three, Way Station by Clifford D. Simak. This is a classic science fiction novel about Enoch Wallace, the 124-year-old Civil War veteran and caretaker of a station that allows travelers across the galaxy a place to rest when they happen to be in our little corner. All kinds of interesting aliens show up, and something rather dangerous. Number two, The Fifth Head of Cerberus by Gene Wolfe. What can I say? It's Gene Wolfe, and he is one of those authors I always read. 
This is actually three novellas set on twin worlds colonized by humans who displace the shape-shifting aboriginals. Things don't go well. The first and title story has a scene where the protagonist, number five, is brought before his very distant and usually inaccessible father and discovers who he really is. I have a lot of empathy for that scene. And number one, Calculating God by Robert J. Sawyer. An alien lands outside a museum in Toronto and asks to see a paleontologist because he or it or whatever it is brings proof that God is written into the fossil record or something like that. Sawyer is a mind-blowing author and this is one of his most mind-blowing. Okay, that's it. Until the list changes. Old guy here.